Five people fall to their deaths when a bridge collapses in Peru. Can Brother Juniper discover the reason that these five individuals had to die? Thornton Wilder, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to Season 17 of the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. Please sign up to be a supporter for as little as $5 a month. We'll give you a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Your support on a monthly basis is vital to keep us going. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. Thornton Wilder won two Pulitzer Prizes. One for the novel We'll Begin Today, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, and another for his play Our Town. In The Bridge of San Luis Rey, Brother Juniper witnesses the tragedy of five people falling to their deaths when a bridge collapses in Peru. He takes it upon himself to study the lives of those who fell in the accident in an effort to figure out why these five people had to die. In 1998, the book was selected by the American Modern Library as one of the 100 best novels of the 20th century. It has also been hinted that this book is the progenitor of the modern-day disaster epic, where a single disaster intertwines the lives of the victims, whose previous histories are then explored through a series of flashbacks. British Prime Minister Tony Blair quoted the final words of the book in a memorial service for the victims of the September 11th attacks. Nine days after the attacks, he read, A witness to the deaths, wanting to make sense of them and explain the ways of God to his fellow human beings, examined the lives of the people who died. And these words were said by someone who knew the victims and who had been through the many emotions and the many stages of bereavement and loss. But soon we will die, and all memories of those five will have left the earth, and we ourselves shall be loved for a while and forgotten. But the love will have been enough. All those impulses of love return to the love that made them. Even memory is not necessary for love. There is a land of the living and a land of the dead. And the bridge is love. The only survival. The only meaning. And now, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, Part 1 of 3, by Thornton Wilder. Part 1. Perhaps an Accident On Friday noon, July the 20th, 1714, the finest bridge in all Peru broke and precipitated five travelers into the gulf below. This bridge was on the high road between Lima and Cusco, and hundreds of persons passed over it every day. It had been woven of osier by the Incas more than a century before, and visitors to the city were always led out to see it. It was a mere ladder of thin slats swung out over the gorge with handrails of dried vine. Horses and coaches and chairs had to go down hundreds of feet below and pass over the narrow torrent on rafts. But no one, not even the viceroy, not even the Archbishop of Lima had descended with the baggage rather than cross by the famous bridge of San Luis Rey. San Luis of France himself protected it, by his name and by the little mud church on the further side. The bridge seemed to be among the things that last forever. It was unthinkable that it should break. The moment a Peruvian heard of the accident, he signed himself, 
and made a mental calculation as to how recently he had crossed by it, and how soon he had intended crossing by it again. People wandered about in a trance-like state, muttering. They had the hallucination of seeing themselves falling into a gulf. There was a great service in the cathedral. The bodies of the victims were approximately collected and approximately separated from one another. And there was a great searching of hearts in the beautiful city of Lima. Servant girls returned bracelets which they had stolen from their mistresses, and usurers harangued their wives angrily in defense of usury. Yet it was rather strange that this event should have so impressed the Lemians, for in that country those catastrophes which lawyers shockingly call the acts of God were more than usually frequent. Tidal waves were continually washing away cities. Earthquakes arrived every week, and towers fell upon good men and women all the time. Diseases were forever flitting in and out of the provinces, and old age carried away some of the most admirable citizens. That is why it was so surprising that the Peruvians should have been especially touched by the rent in the bridge of San Luis Rey. Everyone was deeply impressed, but only one person did anything about it, and that was Brother Juniper. By a series of coincidences so extraordinary that one almost suspects the presence of some intention, this little red-haired Franciscan from northern Italy happened to be in Peru converting the Indians, and happened to witness the accident. It was a very hot noon, that fatal noon, and coming around the shoulder of a hill, Brother Juniper stopped to wipe his forehead and to gaze upon the screen of snowy peaks in the distance. Then, into the gorge below him, filled with the dark plumage of green trees and green birds, and traversed by its ladder of osier. Joy was in him. Things were not going badly. He had opened several little abandoned churches, and the Indians were crawling in to early mass, and groaning at the moment of miracle as though their hearts would break. Perhaps it was the pure air from the snows before him. Perhaps it was the memory that brushed him for a moment, of the poem that bade him raise his eyes to the helpful hills. At all events, he felt at peace. Then, his glance fell upon the bridge, and at that moment, a twanging noise filled the air, as when the string of some musical instrument snaps in a disused room, and he saw the bridge divide and fling five gesticulating ants into the valley below. Anyone else would have said to himself with secret joy, within ten minutes myself. But it was another thought that visited Brother Juniper. Why did this happen to those five? If there were any plan in the universe at all, if there were any pattern in a human life, surely it could be discovered mysteriously latent in those lives so suddenly cut off. Either we live by accident and die by accident, or we live by plan and die by plan. And on that instant, Brother Juniper made the resolve to inquire into the secret lives of those five persons, that moment falling through the air, and to surmise the reason of their taking off. It seemed to Brother Juniper that it was high time for theology to take its place among the exact sciences, and he had long intended putting it there. What he had lacked hitherto was a laboratory. Oh, there had never been any lack of specimens. Any number of his charges had met calamity. Spiders had stung them, their lungs had been touched, their houses had burned down, and things had happened to their children, from which one averts the mind. But these occasions of human woe had never been quite fit for scientific examination. They had lacked what our good savants were later to call proper control. The accident had been dependent upon human error, for example, or had contained elements of probability. But this collapse of the bridge of San Luis Rey was a sheer act of God. 
It afforded a perfect laboratory. Here at last, one could surmise his intentions in a pure state. You and I can see that, coming from anyone but Brother Juniper, this plan would be the flower of a perfect skepticism. It resembled the effort of those presumptuous souls who wanted to walk on the pavements of heaven and built the Tower of Babel to get there. But to our Franciscan, there was no element of doubt in the experiment. He knew the answer. He merely wanted to prove it historically, mathematically, to his converts, poor, obstinate converts, so slow to believe that their pains were inserted into their lives for their own good. People were always asking for good, sound proofs. Doubt springs eternal in the human breast, even in countries where the Inquisition can read your very thoughts in your eyes. This was not the first time that Brother Juniper had tried to resort to such methods, often on the long trips he had to make, scurrying from parish to parish, his robe tucked up about his knees for haste. He would fall to dreaming of experiments that justify the ways of God to man. For instance, a complete record of the prayers for rain and their results. Often he had stood on the steps of one of his little churches, his flock kneeling before him on the baked street. Often he had stretched his arms to the sky and declaimed the splendid ritual. Not often, but several times, he had felt the virtue enter him and seen the little cloud forming on the horizon. But there were many times when weeks went by. But why think of them? It was not himself he was trying to convince that rain and drought were wisely apportioned, Thus it was that the determination rose within him at the moment of the accident. It prompted him to busy himself for six years, knocking at all the doors in Lima, asking thousands of questions, filling scores of notebooks, in his effort at establishing the fact that each of the five lost lives was a perfect whole. Everyone knew that he was working on some memorial of the accident, and everyone was very helpful and misleading. A few even knew the principal aim of his activity, and there were patrons in high places. The result of all this diligence was an enormous book, which, as we shall see later, was publicly burned on a beautiful spring morning in the great square. But there was a secret copy, and after a great many years and without much notice, it found its way to the library of the University of San Marco. There it lies, between two great wooden covers, collecting dust in a cupboard. It deals with one after another of the victims of the accident, cataloging thousands of little facts and anecdotes and testimonies, and concluding with a dignified passage describing why God had settled upon that person and upon that day for his demonstration of wisdom. Yet for all his diligence, Brother Juniper never knew the central passion of Doña Maria's life, nor of Uncle Pio's, not even of Esteban's. And I, who claim to know so much more, isn't it possible that even I have missed the very spring within the spring? Some say that we shall never know, and that to the gods, we are like the flies that the boys kill on a summer day. And some say, on the contrary, that the very sparrows do not lose a feather that has not been brushed away by the finger of God. Part 2 The Marquesa de Montemayor Any Spanish schoolboy is required to know today more about Doña Maria Marquese de Montemayor, than Brother Juniper was to discover in years of research. Within a century of her death, her letters had become one of the monuments of Spanish literature, and her life and times have ever since been the object of long studies. But her biographers have erred in one direction as greatly as the Franciscan did in another. They have tried to invest her with a host of graces, to read back into her life and person 
some of the beauties that abound in her letters. Whereas all real knowledge of this wonderful woman must proceed from the act of humiliating her and of divesting her of all beauties save one. She was the daughter of a cloth merchant who had acquired the money and the hatred of the Lemians within a stone's throw of the plaza. Her childhood was unhappy. She was ugly. She stuttered. Her mother persecuted her with sarcasms in an effort to arouse some social charms and forced her to go about the town in a veritable harness of jewels. She lived alone, and she thought alone. Many suitors presented themselves, but as long as she could, she fought against the convention of her time and was determined to remain single. There were hysterical scenes with her mother, recriminations, screams, and slamming of doors. At last, at twenty-six, she found herself penned into marriage with a supercilious and ruined nobleman, and the Cathedral of Lima fairly buzzed with the sneers of her guests. Still, she lived alone and thought alone, and when an exquisite daughter was born to her, she fastened upon her an idolatrous love. But little Clara took after her father. She was cold and intellectual. At the age of eight, she was calmly correcting her mother's speech and presently regarding her with astonishment and repulsion. The frightened mother became meek and obsequious, but she could not prevent herself from persecuting Doña Clara with nervous attention and a fatiguing love. Again there were hysterical recriminations, screams and slamming of doors. From the offers of marriage that fell to her, Doña Clara deliberately chose the one that required her removal to Spain. So to Spain she went, to that land from which it takes six months to receive an answer to one's letter. The leave-taking before so long a voyage became in Peru one of the formal services of the church. The ship was blessed, and as the space widened between the vessel and the beach, both companies knelt and sang a hymn that never failed to sound weak and timid in all that open air. Doña Clara sailed with most admirable composure, leaving her mother to gaze after the bright ship, her hand pressing now her heart and now her mouth. Blurred and streaked became her view of the serene Pacific and the enormous clouds of pearl that hang forever motionless above it. Left alone in Lima, the Marquesa's life grew more and more inward. She became increasingly negligent in her dress, and like all lonely people, she talked to herself audibly. All her existence lay in the burning center of her mind. On that stage were performed endless dialogues with her daughter, impossible reconciliations, scenes eternally recommenced of remorse and forgiveness. On the street you beheld an old woman, her red wig fallen a little over one ear, her left cheek angry with a leprous affection, her right with a complimentary adjustment of rouge. Her chin was never dry, her lips were never still. Lima was a city of eccentrics, but even there she became its jest, as she drove through the streets or shuffled up the steps of its churches. She was thought to be continuously drunk. Worse things were said of her, and petitions were afloat that she be locked up. She had been denounced three times before the Inquisition. It is not impossible that she might have been burned had her son-in-law been less influential in Spain, and had she not somehow collected a few friends about the viceregal court who suffered her for her oddity and her wide reading. The distressing character of the relations between mother and daughter were further embittered by misunderstandings over money. The Condesa received a handsome allowance from her mother and frequent gifts. Doña Clara soon became the outstanding woman of intelligence at the Spanish court. All the wealth of Peru would have been insufficient to maintain her in the grandiose style she fancied for herself. Strangely enough, her extravagance proceeded from one of the best traits in her nature. 
She regarded her friends, her servants, and all the interesting people in the capital as her children. In fact, there seemed only one person in the world towards whom she did not expend herself in kind offices. Among her protégés was the cartographer de Blasis, whose maps of the New World was dedicated to the Marquesa de Montemayor amid the roars of the courtiers at Lima, who read that she was the admiration of her city and a rising sun in the West. Another was the scientist Azuarius, whose treatise on the laws of hydraulics was suppressed by the Inquisition as being too exciting. For a decade, the Condesa literally sustained all the arts and sciences of Spain. It was not her fault that nothing memorable was produced in that time. About four years after Doña Clara's departure, Doña Maria received her permission to visit Europe. On both sides, the visit was anticipated with resolutions well-nourished on self-reproach. The one to be patient, the other to be undemonstrative. Both failed. Each tortured the other, and was on the point of losing her mind under the alternations of self-rebuke and the outbursts of passion. At length one day Doña Maria rose before dawn, daring no more than to kiss the door behind which her daughter was sleeping, took ship, and returned to America. Henceforth, letter-writing had to take the place of all the affection that could not be lived. Hers were the letters that, in an astonishing world, have become the textbook of schoolboys and the anthill of the grammarians. Doña Maria would have invented her genius had she not been born with it. So necessary was it to her love that she attract the attention, perhaps the admiration, of her distant child. She forced herself to go out into society in order to cull its ridicules. She taught her eye to observe. She read the masterpieces of her language to discover its effects. She insinuated herself into the company of those who were celebrated for their conversation. Night after night, in her Baroque palace, she wrote and rewrote the incredible pages, forcing from her despairing mind those miracles of wit and grace, those distilled chronicles of the viceregal court. We know now that her daughter barely glanced at the letters, and that it is to the son-in-law that we owe their preservation. The Marquesa would have been astonished to learn that her letters were immortal. Yet many critics have accused her of keeping one eye on posterity, and point to a number of letters that have all the air of being bravura pieces. To them it seems impossible that Doña Maria should have put herself to the same pains to dazzle her daughter that most artists expend on dazzling the public. Like her son-in-law, they misunderstood her. The conde delighted in her letters, but he thought that when he had enjoyed the style, he had extracted all their richness and intention, missing, as most readers do, the whole purport of literature, which is the notation of the heart. Style is but the faintly contemptible vessel in which the bitter liquid is recommended to the world. The Marquesa would even have been astonished to learn that her letters were very good, for such authors live always in the noble weather of their own minds, and those productions which seem remarkable to us are little better than a day's routine to them. This was the old woman, who hour by hour would sit upon her balcony, her odd straw hat casting a purple shadow across her lined and yellow face. How often, as she turned her pages with her gemmed hands, she would ask herself, almost with amusement, whether the constant pain at her heart had an organic seed. She wondered whether a subtle doctor cutting through to that battered throne could at last discover a sign, and lifting his face to the amphitheater, cry out to his students, This woman has suffered, and her suffering has left its mark upon the structure of her heart. This idea had so often visited her, that one day she wrote it into a letter, and her daughter scolded her for an introspective and for making a cult of sorrow. 
the knowledge that she would never be loved in return, acted upon her ideas as a tide acts upon cliffs. Her religious beliefs went first, for all she could ask of a god or of immortality was the gift of a place where daughters love their mothers. The other attributes of heaven you could have for a song. Next she lost her belief in the sincerity of those about her. She secretly refused to believe that anyone, herself accepted, loved anyone. All families lived in a wasteful atmosphere of custom and kissed one another with secret indifference. She saw that the people of this world moved about in an armor of egotism, drunk with self-gazing, a thirst for compliments, hearing little of what was said to them, unmoved by the accidents that befell their closest friends, in dread of all appeals that might interrupt their long communion with their own desires. These were the sons and daughters of Adam, from Cathay to Peru. And when on the balcony her thoughts reached this turn, her mouth would contract with shame, for she knew that she too sinned, and that though her love for daughter was vast enough to include all the colors of love, it was not without a shade of tyranny. She loved her daughter not for her daughter's sake, but for her own. She longed to free herself from this ignoble bond, but the passion was too fierce to cope with. And then on that green balcony a strange warfare would shake the hideous old lady, a singularly futile struggle against a temptation to which she would never have the opportunity of succumbing. How could she rule her daughter when her daughter saw to it that four thousand miles lay between them? Nevertheless, Doña Maria wrestled with the ghost of her temptation and was worsted on every occasion. She wanted her daughter for herself. She wanted to hear her say, You are the best of all possible mothers. She longed to hear her whisper, Forgive me. About two years after her return from Spain, there took place a series of inconspicuous events that had a great deal to tell about the inner life of the Marquesa. Only the faintest allusion to them occurs in the correspondence, but as that is found in letter 22, which contains other signs, I shall do my best to give a translation and commentary of the first part of the letter. Are there no doctors in Spain? Where are those good men from Flanders that used to help you so? Oh, my treasure, how can we punish you enough for letting your cold endure so many weeks? Don Vicente, I implore you to make my child see reason. Angels of heaven, I implore you to make my child see reason. And now that you are better, I beg of you, resolve that when the first warning of a cold comes, you will steam yourself well and go to bed. Here in Peru I am helpless, I can do nothing. Do not be self-willed, my beloved. God bless you. I am enclosing in today's packet the gum of some tree, which the sisters of San Tomas pedal from door to door. Whether it be of much use, I know not. It can do no harm. I am told that in the convent the silly sisters inhale it so diligently that one cannot smell the incense at Mass. Whether it be worth anything, I know not. Try it. Rest easy, my love. I am sending His Most Catholic Majesty the perfect gold chain. Her daughter had written her, the chain arrived in good condition, and I wore it at the christening of the Infanta. His Most Catholic Majesty was gracious enough to admire it, and when I told him that you had given it me, he sent you his compliments upon your taste. Do not fail to send him one as like it as possible. Send it at once, by way of the Chamberlain. He need never know that in order to obtain it I had to walk into a picture. Do you remember that in the sacristy of San Martin, there is a portrait by Velázquez of the viceroy, who founded the monastery, and of his wife and brat, and that his wife is wearing a gold chain. I resolved that only that chain would do. 
So one midnight I slipped into the sacristy, climbed upon the robing table like a girl of twelve, and walked in. The canvas resisted for a moment, for the painter himself came forward to lift me through the pigment. I told him that the most beautiful girl in Spain wished to present the finest gold chain that could be found to the most gracious king in the world. It was as simple as that. And there we stood talking, we four, in the grey and silvery air that makes a Velasquez. Now I keep thinking about a more golden light. I keep looking at the palace. I must pass the evening in a Titian. Would the Viceroy let me? But His Excellency has the gout again. I say again, because the flattery of the court insists that there are times when he is free of it. This being St. Mark's Day, His Excellency started out to visit the university, where twenty-two new doctors were being brought into the world. He had hardly been carried from his divan to his coach, when he screamed and refused to go any farther. He was carried back to his bed, where he broke a most delicious cigar, and sent for the pericole. And while we listened to long doctrinal addresses, more or less in Latin, he heard all about us, more or less in Spanish, from the reddest and cruelest lips in town. Doña Maria permitted herself this passage, although she had just read in her daughter's last letter, How many times must I tell you to be more cautious in the things you say in your letters? They often show signs of having been opened on the journey. Nothing could be more ill-judged than your remarks on the you-know-what-I-mean at Cusco. Such remarks are not funny. Even though Vicente did compliment you upon them in his postscript, and they might get us into a great deal of trouble with certain persons here in Spain, I continue to be astonished that your indiscretions have not long since led to your being ordered to retire to your farm. There was a great press at the exercises, and two women fell from the balcony. But God in his goodness saw that they fell on Doña Merced. All three are badly hurt, but will be thinking of other things within a year. The President was speaking at the moment of the accident, and being short-sighted, could not imagine what the disturbance of cries and talk and falling bodies could be about. It was very pleasant to see him bowing under the impression that he was being applauded. Speaking of the paracole and of applause, you should know that Pepita and I decided to go to the Comedia this evening. The public still idolizes its paracole, and even forgives her her years. We are told that she saves what she can every morning by passing alternate pencils of ice and fire across her cheeks. Translation falls especially short of this conceit, which carries the whole flamboyance of the Spanish language. It was intended as an obsequious flattery of the Condesa, and was untrue. The great actress was twenty-eight at this time. Her cheeks had the smoothness and polish of dark yellow marble, and would certainly have retained that quality for many years. Apart from the cosmetics required by her performances, the only treatment Camila Pericole afforded her face was to throw cold water at it twice a day, like a peasant woman at a horse trough. That curious man they call Uncle Pio is by her all the time. Don Rubio says that he cannot make out whether Uncle Pio is her father, her lover, or her son. The Pericole gave a wonderful performance. Scold me all you like for a provincial ninny. You have no such actresses in Spain. And so on. It is on this visit to the theatre that further matter hangs. She decided to go to the Comedia, where the Pericole was playing Doña Leonor in Moreto's Trampa Adelante. Perhaps some material could be derived from the visit for her daughter's next letter. She took with her Pepita, a little girl about whom later we shall learn much. Doña Maria had borrowed her from the orphanage connected with the convent of Santa Maria Rosa de las Rosas to be her companion. The Marquesa sat in her box, gazing with flagging attention at the brilliant stage. Between the acts, it was the Pericole's custom to lay aside the courtly role and appear before the curtain to sing a few topical songs. The malicious actress had seen the Marquesa arrive, 
and presently began improvising couplets alluding to her appearance, her avarice, her drunkenness, and even to her daughter's flight from her. The attention of the house was subtly directed to the old woman, and a rising murmur of contempt accompanied the laughter of the audience. But the Marquesa, deeply moved by the first two acts of the comedy, scarcely saw the singer and sat staring before her, thinking about Spain. Camila Perecol became bolder, and the air was electric with the hatred and glee of the crowd. At last Pepita plucked the Marquesa's sleeve and whispered to her that they should go. As they left the box, the house arose and burst into a roar of triumph. The Perecol flung herself into a frenzied dance, for she saw the manager at the back of the hall and knew that her salary had been increased. But the Marquesa remained unaware of what had taken place. In fact, she was quite pleased, for during the visit she had contrived a few felicitous phrases, phrases, who knows, that might bring a smile to her daughter's face, and might make her murmur, Really, my mother is charming. In due time the report reached the Viceroy's ears that one of his aristocrats had been openly baited in the theatre. He summoned the Pericol to the palace and ordered her to call upon the Marquesa and to apologize. The trip was to be made barefoot and in a black dress. Camila argued and fought, but all she gained was a pair of shoes. The Viceroy had three reasons for insisting. In the first place, the singer had taken liberties with his court. Don Andres had contrived to make exile endurable by building up a ceremonial so complicated that it could be remembered only by a society that had nothing else to think about. He nursed his little aristocracy and its minute distinctions, and any insult paid to a marquesa was an insult to his person. In the second place, Doña Maria's son-in-law was an increasingly important personage in Spain, laden with possibilities of injury to the viceroy, nay, with the possibility of supplanting him. The Conde Vicente d'Abuire must not be vexed, even through his half-wit mother-in-law. Finally, the viceroy was delighted to humble the actress. He suspected that she was deceiving him with a matador, perhaps with an actor. Between the flattery of the court and the inertia of gout, he could not quite make out who it was. At all events, it was clear that the singer was beginning to forget that he was one of the first men in the world. The Marquesa, beside not having heard the scurrilous songs, was in other ways unprepared for the actress's visit. You should know that after the departure of her daughter, Doña Maria had lighted upon a certain consolation. She had taken to drinking. Everyone drank chicha in Peru, and there was no particular disgrace in being found unconscious on a feast day. Doña Maria had begun to discover that her feverish monologues had a way of keeping her awake all night. Once she took a delicate fluted glassful of chicha on retiring. Oblivion was so sweet that presently she stole larger amounts and tried dissimulating their effects from Pepita. She hinted that she was not well, and represented herself as going into a decline. At last, she resigned all pretense. The boats that carried her letter to Spain did not leave oftener than once a month. During the week that preceded the making of the packet, she observed a strict regimen, and cultivated the city assiduously for material. At last, on the eve of the post, she wrote the letter, making up the bundle towards dawn and leaving it for Pepita to deliver to the agent. Then as the sun rose, she would shut herself up in her room with some flagons and drift through the next few weeks without the burden of consciousness. Finally, she would emerge from her happiness and prepare to go into a state of training in preparation for the writing of another letter. Thus, on the night following the scandal in the theater, she wrote letter 22 and retired to bed with a carafe. All next day Pepita moved about the room, glancing anxiously at the figure on the bed. The next afternoon, 
Pepita brought her needlework into the room. The Marquesa lay staring at the ceiling with wide open eyes, talking to herself. Towards dusk, Pepita was called to the door and informed that the Pericole had come to see the mistress. Pepita remembered the theater very well and sent back word angrily that the mistress refused to see her. The man carried the message to the street door, but returned awestruck with the news that the Signora Pericol was armed with a letter from the Viceroy presenting her to the lady. Pepita tiptoed to the bed and started talking to the Marquesa. The glazed eyes moved to the girl's face. Pepita shook her gently. With great effort, Doña Maria tried to fix her mind on what was being said to her. Twice she lay back, refusing to seize the meaning. But at last, like a general, calling together in a rain and by night the dispersed division of his army, she assembled memory and attention and a few other faculties, and painfully pressing her hand to her forehead, she asked for a bowl of snow. When it was brought her, she long and drowsily pressed handfuls of it against her temples and cheeks. Then rising, she stood for a long time, leaning against the bed and looking at her shoes. At last, she raised her head with decision. She called for her fur-trimmed cloak and a veil. She put them on and tottered into her handsomest reception room, where the actress stood waiting for her. Camila had intended to be perfunctory, and if possible, impudent. But now she was struck for the first time with the dignity of the old woman. The mercer's daughter could carry herself at times with all the distinction of the Montemayors, and when she was drunk, she wore the grandeur of Hecuba. For Camila, the half-closed eyes had the air of weary authority, and she began almost timidly, I come, Signora, to make sure that you could not have misunderstood anything I said on the evening that your grace did me the honor to visit my theater. Misunderstood? Misunderstood? said the Marquesa. Your grace might have misunderstood and thought that my words were intended to be disrespectful to your grace. To me? Your grace is not offended at her humble servant. Your grace is aware that a poor actress in my position may be carried beyond her intentions, that it is very difficult, that everything... How can I be offended, Signora? All that I can remember is that you gave a beautiful performance. You are a great artist. You should be happy, happy. My handkerchief, Pepita. The Marquesa brought out these words very rapidly and vaguely, but the pericole was confounded. A piercing sense of shame filled her. She turned crimson. At last she was able to murmur, It was in the songs between the acts of the comedy. I was afraid, Your Grace. Yes, yes, I remember now. I left early. Pepita, we left early, did we not? But, Signora... You are good enough to forgive my leaving early, yes, even in the middle of your admirable performance. I forget why we left. Pepita? Oh, some indisposition. It was impossible that anyone in the theatre could have missed the intention of the songs. Camilla could only assume that the Marquesa, out of a sort of fantastic magnanimity, was playing the farce of not having noticed it. She was almost in tears. But you are so good to overlook my childishness, Signora. I mean your grace. I did not know. I did not know your goodness. Signora, permit me to kiss your hand. Doña Maria held out her hand, astonished. She had not for a long time been addressed with such consideration. Her neighbors, her tradespeople... Her servants, for even Pepita lived in awe of her. Her very daughter had never approached her thus. It induced a new mood in her, one that must very likely be called maudlin. She became loquacious. Offended? 
offended at you, my beautiful, my gifted child? Who am I? A, an unwise and unloved old woman, to be offended at you. I felt, my daughter, as though I were, what says the poet, surprising through a cloud the conversation of the angels. Your voice kept finding new wonders in our moretto. When you said, Don Juan, si mi amor estimas, y la fe segura es necia, enojarte mis temores es no quiarme, discreta, tan seguros, and so on, that was true. And what a gesture you made at the close of the first day, there with your hands so, such a gesture as the Virgin made, saying to Gabriel, How is it possible that I shall have a child? No, no, you will begin to have resentment at me, for I am going to tell you about a gesture that you may remember to you some day, yes. It would fit well into that scene where you forgive your Don Juan de Lara. Perhaps I should tell you that I saw it made one day by my daughter. My daughter is a very beautiful woman. Everyone thinks. Did, did you know my Doña Clara, Signora? Her grace often did me the honor of visiting my theater. I knew the Condessa well by sight. Do not remain so on one knee, my child. Pepita, tell Henarito to make this lady some sweet cakes at once. Think, one day we fell out. I forget over what. Oh, there is nothing strange in that. All we mothers from time to time. Look, can you come a little closer? You must not believe the town that says she was unkind to me. You are a great woman with a beautiful nature, and you can see further than the crowd sees in these matters. It is a pleasure to talk to you. What beautiful hair you have! What beautiful hair! She had not a warm, impulsive nature, I know that, but, oh, my child, she has such a store of intelligence and graciousness. Any misunderstandings between us are so plainly my fault. Is it not wonderful that she is so quick to forgive me? This day there fell one of those little moments. We both said hasty things and went off to our rooms, then each turned back to be forgiven. Finally only a door separated us, and there we were, pulling it in contrary ways, but at last she took my face, thus, in her two white hands. So, look. The Marquesa almost fell out of her chair as she leaned forward, her face streaming with happy tears, and made the beatific gesture. I should say the mythical gesture, for the incident was but a recurring dream. I am glad you are here, she continued, for now you have heard from my own lips that she is not unkind to me, as some people say. Listen, Senora, the fault was mine. Look at me. Look at me. There was some mistake that made me the mother of so beautiful a girl. I am difficult. I am trying. You and she are great women. No, do not stop me. You are rare women. And I am only a nervous, a foolish, a stupid woman. Let me kiss your feet. I am impossible. I am impossible. I am impossible. Here indeed the old woman did fall out of her chair, and was gathered up by Pepita, and led back to her bed. The paracol walked home in consternation, and sat for a long time gazing into her eyes in the mirror, her palms pressed against her cheeks. But the person who saw most of the difficult hours of the Marquesa was her little companion, Pepita. Pepita was an orphan, and had been brought up by that strange genius of Lima, the Abbess Madre Maria del Pilar. 
The only occasion upon which the two great women of Peru, as the perspective of history was to reveal them, met face to face, was on the day when Doña Maria called upon the directress of the convent of Santa Maria Rosa de la Rosas, and asked if she might borrow some bright girl from the orphanage to be her companion. The abbess gazed hard at the grotesque old woman. Even the wisest people in the world are not perfectly wise, and Madre Maria del Pilar, who was able to divine the poor human heart behind all the masks of folly and defiance, had always refused to concede one to the Marquesa de Montemayor. She asked her a great many questions and then paused to think. She wanted to give Pepita the worldly experience of living in the palace. She also wanted to bend the old woman to her own interests, and she was filled with a somber indignation, for she knew she was gazing at one of the richest women in Peru and the blindest. She was one of those persons who have allowed their lives to be gnawed away because they had fallen in love with an idea several centuries before its appointed appearance in the history of civilization. She hurled herself against the obstinacy of her time in her desire to attach a little dignity to women. At midnight, when she had finished adding up the accounts of the house, she would fall into insane vision of an age when women could be organized to protect women. Women traveling, women as servants, women when they are old or ill, the women she had discovered in the mines of Potosi or in the workrooms of the cloth merchants, the girls she had collected out of doorways on rainy nights. But always the next morning she had to face the fact that the women in Peru, even her nuns, went through life with two notions. One, that all the misfortunes that might befall them were merely due to the fact that they were not sufficiently attractive to bind some man to their maintenance, and two, that all the misery in the world was worth his caress. She had never known any country but the environs of Lima, and she assumed that all its corruption was the normal state of mankind. Looking back from our century, we can see the whole folly of her hope. Twenty such women would have failed to make any impression on that age. Yet she continued diligently in her task. She resembled the swallow in the fable, who once every thousand years transferred a grain of wheat in the hope of rearing a mountain to reach the moon. Such persons are raised up in every age. They obstinately insist on transporting their grains of wheat and they derive a certain exhilaration from the sneers of the bystanders. How queerly they dress, we cry. How queerly they dress. Her plain red face had great kindliness, and more idealism than kindliness, and more generalship than idealism. All her work, her hospitals, her orphanage, her convent, her sudden journeys of rescue, depended upon money. No one harbored a fairer admiration for mere goodness, but she had been obliged to watch herself sacrificing her kindliness, almost her idealism, to generalship. So dreadful were the struggles to obtain her subsidies from her superiors in the church. The Archbishop of Lima, whom we shall know later in a more graceful connection, hated her with what he called a Vatinian hate, and counted the cessation of her visits among the compensations for dying. Lately she had felt not only the breath of old age against her cheek, but a graver warning. A chill of terror went through her, not for herself, but for her work. Who was there in Peru to value the things she had valued? And rising one day at dawn, she had made a rapid journey through her hospital and convent and orphanage, looking for a soul she might train to be her successor. She hurried from empty face to empty face, occasionally pausing more from hope than conviction. In the courtyard, she came upon a company of girls at work over the linen, and her eyes fell at once upon a girl of twelve, 
who was directing the others at the trough, and at the same time recounting to them with great dramatic fire the less probable miracles in the life of St. Rose of Lima. So it was that the search ended with Pepita. The education for greatness is difficult enough at any time, but amid the sensibilities and jealousies of a convent, it must be conducted with fantastic indirection. Pepita was assigned to the most disliked tasks in the house, but she came to understand all the aspects of its administration. She accompanied the abbess on her journeys, even though it was in the capacity of custodian of the eggs and vegetables. And everywhere, by surprise, hours would open up in which the directress suddenly appeared and talked to her at great length, not only on religious experience, but on how to manage women, and how to plan contagious wards, and how to beg for money. It was a step in this education for greatness that led to Pepita's arriving one day and entering upon the crazy duties of being Doña Maria's companion. For the first two years, she merely came for occasional afternoons, but finally she came to the palace to live. She never had been taught to expect happiness, and the inconveniences, not to say terrors, of her new position did not seem to her excessive for a girl of fourteen. She did not suspect that the abbess, even there, was hovering above the house, herself estimating the stresses and watching for the moment when a burden harms and not strengthens. A few of Pepita's trials were physical. For example, the servants in the house took advantage of Doña Maria's indisposition. They opened up the bedrooms of the palace to their relatives. They stole freely. Alone, Pepita stood out against them and suffered a persecution of small discomforts and practical jokes. Her mind, similarly, had its distresses. When she accompanied Doña Maria on her errands in the city, the older woman would be seized with the desire to dash into a church, for what she had lost of religion as faith, she had replaced with religion as magic. Stay here in the sunlight, my dear child. I shall not be long, she would say. Doña Maria would then forget herself in a reverie before the altar and leave the church by another door. Pepita had been brought up by Madre Maria del Pilar to an almost morbid obedience, and when after many hours she ventured into the church and made sure that her mistress was no longer there, still, she returned to the street corner and waited while the shadows fell gradually across the square. Thus waiting in public, she suffered all the torture of a little girl's self-consciousness. She still wore the uniform of the orphanage, which a minute's thoughtfulness on the part of Doña Maria could have altered. And she suffered hallucinations, wherein men seemed to be staring at her and whispering. Nor were these always hallucinations. No less her heart suffered. For on some days, Doña Maria would suddenly become aware of her and would talk to her cordially and humorously, would let appear for a few hours all the exquisite sensibility of the letters. Then on the morrow, she would withdraw into herself again, and while never harsh, would become impersonal and unseeing. The beginnings of hope and affection that Pepita had such need to expend would be wounded. She tiptoed about the palace, silent, bewildered, clinging only to her sense of duty and her loyalty to her mother in the Lord, Madre Maria del Pilar, who had sent her there. Finally, a new fact appeared that was to have considerable effect on the lives of both the Marquesa and her companion. My dear mother, wrote the Condesa, the weather has been most exhausting, and the fact that the orchards and gardens are in bloom only makes it the more trying. I can endure flowers, if only they had no perfume. I shall therefore ask your permission to write you at less length than usual. If Vicente returns before the post leaves, he will be delighted to finish out the leaf and supply you with those tiresome details about myself, 
which you seem to enjoy so. I shall not go to Grignan in Provence as I expected this fall, as my child will be born in early October. What child? The Marquesa leaned against the wall. Doña Clara had foreseen the exhausting importunities that this news would waken in her mother, and had sought to mitigate them by the casualness of her announcement. The ruse did not succeed. The famous letter 42 was the answer. Now, at length, the Marquesa had something to be anxious about. Her daughter was to become a mother. This event, which merely bored Doña Clara, discovered a whole new scale of emotions in the Marquesa. She became a mine of medical knowledge and suggestion. She combed the city for wise old women and poured into her letters the whole folk wisdom of the new world. She fell into the most abominable superstition. She practiced a degrading system of taboos for her child's protection. She refused to allow a knot in the house. The maids were forbidden to tie up their hair, and she concealed upon her person ridiculous symbols of a happy delivery. On the stairs, even the steps were marked with red chalk, and a maid, who accidentally stepped upon an even step, was driven from the house with tears and screams. Doña Clara was in the hands of malignant nature, who reserves the right to inflict upon her children the most terrifying jests. There was an etiquette of propitiation which generations of peasant women had found comforting. So vast an army of witnesses surely implied that there was some truth in it. At least it could do no harm, and perhaps it did good. But the Marquesa did not only satisfy the rites of paganism, she studied the prescriptions of Christianity as well. She arose in the dark and stumbled through the streets to the earliest masses. She hysterically hugged the altar rails, trying to rend from the gaudy statuettes a sign, only a sign. The ghost of a smile, the furtive nod of a waxen head. Would all be well? Sweet, sweet mother, would all be well? At times... After a day's frantic resort to such invocations, a revulsion would sweep over her. Nature is deaf. God is indifferent. Nothing in man's power can alter the course of law. Then on some street corner she would stop, dizzy with despair, and leaning against a wall would long to be taken from a world that had no plan in it. But soon a belief in the great perhaps would surge up from the depths of her nature, and she would fairly run home to renew the candles above her daughter's bed. At last, the time came to satisfy the supreme right of Peruvian households looking forward to this event. She made the pilgrimage to the shrine of Santa Maria de Clujambuqua. If there resided any efficacy in devotion at all, surely it lay in a visit to this great shrine. The ground had been holy through three religions. Even before the Incan civilization, distraught human beings had hugged the rocks and lashed themselves with whips to wring their will from the skies. Thither, the Marquesa was carried in her chair, crossing the bridge of San Luis Rey and ascending up into the hills toward that city of large, girdled women, a tranquil town, slow-moving and slow-smiling, a city of crystal air, cold as the springs that fed its many fountains, a city of bells, soft and musical, and tuned to carry on with one another the happiest quarrels. If anything turned out for disappointment in the town of Clujambuqua, the grief was somehow assimilated by the overwhelming imminence of the Andes and by the weather of quiet joy that flowed in and about the side streets. No sooner did the Marquesa see from a distance the white walls of this town perched on the knees of the highest peaks than her fingers ceased turning the beads. The busy prayers of her fright were cut short on her lips. She did not even alight at the inn, but leaving Pepita to arrange for their stay, she went over to the church and knelt for a long time, patting her hands 
softly together. She was listening to the new tide of resignation that was rising within her. Perhaps she would learn in time to permit both her daughter and her gods to govern their own affairs. She was not annoyed by the whispering of the old women in padded garments who sold candles and medals and talked about money from dawn to dark. She was not even distracted by an officious sacristan who tried to collect a fee for something or other and who from spite made her change her place under the pretext of repairing a tile on the floor. Presently she went out into the sunshine and sat on the steps of the fountain. She watched the little processions of invalids slowly revolving about the gardens. She watched three hawks plunging about the sky. The children who had been playing by the fountain stared at her for a moment and went away alarmed. But a lama, a lady with a long neck and sweet shallow eyes, burdened down by a fur cape too heavy for her and picking her way delicately down an interminable staircase, came over and offered her a velvet cleft nose to stroke. The lama is deeply interested in the men about her, is even fond of pretending that she too is one of them, and of inserting her head into their conversations, as though in a moment she would lift her voice and contribute a wan and helpful comment. Soon Doña Maria was surrounded by a number of these sisters, who seemed on the point of asking her why she clapped her hands so, and how much her veiling cost a yard. Doña Maria had arranged that any letters arriving from Spain should be brought to her at once by a special messenger. She had traveled slowly from Lima, and even now as she sat in the square, a boy from her farm ran up and put into her hand a large packet wrapped in parchment and dangling some nuggets of sealing wax. Slowly she undid the wrappings. With measured, stoic gestures, she read first an affectionate and jocose note from her son-in-law, then her daughter's letter. It was full of wounding remarks rather brilliantly said, perhaps said for the sheer virtuosity of giving pain neatly. Each of its phrases found its way through the eyes of the Marquesa. Then, carefully wrapped in understanding and forgiveness, it sank into her heart. At last she arose, gently dispersed the sympathetic lamas, and with a grave face returned to the shrine. While Doña Maria was passing the late afternoon in the church and in the square, Pepita was left to prepare their lodging. She showed the porters where to lay down the great wicker hampers and set about unpacking the altar, the brazier, the tapestries, and the portraits of Doña Clara. She descended into the kitchen and gave the cook exact instructions as to the preparation of a certain porridge upon which the Marquesa principally subsisted. Then she returned to the rooms and waited. She resolved to write a letter to the abbess. She hung for a long time over the quill, staring into the distance with trembling lip. She saw the face of Madre Maria del Pilar, so red and scrubbed, and the wonderful black eyes. She heard her voice as at the close of supper, the orphans sitting with lowered eyes and folded hands. She commented on the events of the day, or as, by candlelight, she stood among the beds of the hospital and announced the theme for meditation during the night. But most clearly of all, Pepita remembered the sudden interviews when the abbess, not daring to wait until the girl was older, had discussed with her the duties of her office. She had talked to Pepita as to an equal. Such speeches troubling and wonderful to an intelligent child, and Madre Maria del Pilar had abused it. She had expanded Pepita's vision of how she should feel and act beyond the measure of her years. And she had unthinkingly turned upon Pepita the full blaze of her personality, as Jupiter had turned his upon Semele. Pepita was frightened by her sense of insufficiency. She hid it and wept. And then the abbess had cast the child into the discipline of this long solitude, 
where Pepita struggled, refusing to let herself believe that she had been abandoned. And now, from this strange inn in these strange mountains, where the altitude was making her light-headed, Pepita longed for the dear presence, the only real thing in her life. She wrote a letter, all ink stains and incoherence. Then she went downstairs to see about fresh charcoal and to taste the porridge. The Marquesa came in and sat down at the table. I can do no more. What will be, will be, she whispered. She unbound from her neck amulets of her superstition and dropped them into the glowing brazier. She had a strange sense of having antagonized God by too much prayer, and so addressed him now obliquely. After all, it is in the hands of another. I no longer claim the least influence. What will be, will be. She sat for a long time, her palms against her cheeks, making a blank of her mind. Her eyes fell on Pepita's letter. She opened it mechanically and started to read. She had read a full half of it before her attention was aware of the meaning of the words. But all this is nothing if you like me and wish me to stay with her. I oughtn't to tell you, but every now and then the bad chambermaids lock me up in rooms and steal things, and perhaps my lady will think that I steal them. I hope not. I hope you are well and not having any trouble in the hospital or anywhere. Though I never see you, I think of you all the time, and I remember what you told me, my dear mother in God. I want to do only what you want. But if you could let me come back for a few days to the convent, but not if you do not wish it. But I am so much alone and not talking to anyone and everything. Sometimes I do not know whether you have forgotten me, and if you could find a minute to write me a little letter or something, I could keep it. But I know how busy you are. Doña Maria read no further. She folded the letter and put it aside. For a moment she was filled with envy. She longed to command another soul as completely as this nun was able to do. Most of all, she longed to be back in this simplicity of love, to throw off the burden of pride and vanity that hers had always carried. To quiet the tumult in her mind, she picked up a book of devotion and tried to fix her attention upon the words. But after a moment, she suddenly felt the need to reread the whole letter, to surprise, if possible, the secret of so much felicity. Pepita returned, bringing the supper in her hands, followed by a maid. Doña Maria watched her over the top of her book as she would have watched a visitor from heaven. Pepita tiptoed about the room, laying the table and whispering directions to her assistant. Your supper is ready, my lady, she said at last. But, my child, you are going to eat with me? In Lima, Pepita generally sat down at the table with her mistress. I thought you would be tired, my lady. I had my supper downstairs. She does not wish to eat with me, thought the Marquesa. She knows me and has rejected me. Would you like me to read aloud to you while you are eating, my lady? asked Pepita, who felt that she had made a mistake. No, you may go to bed if you choose. Thank you, my lady. Doña Maria had risen and approached the table. With one hand on the back of the chair, she said haltingly, My dear child, I am sending off a letter to Lima in the morning. If you have one, you can enclose it with mine. No, I have none, said Pepita. She added hastily, I must go downstairs and get you the new charcoal. But my dear... You have one for Madre Maria del Pilar, wouldn't you? Pepita pretended to be busy over the brazier. No, I'm not going to send it, she said. 
she was aware during the long pause that followed that the Marquesa was staring at her in stupefaction. I've changed my mind. I know she would like a letter from you, Pepita. It would make her very happy, I know. Pepita was reddening. She said loudly, The innkeeper said that there would be some new charcoal ready for you at dark. I'll tell them to bring it up now. She glanced hastily at the old woman and saw that she had not ceased from staring at her with great, sad, inquiring eyes. Pepita felt that these were not things one talked about, but the strange woman seemed to be feeling the matter so strongly that Pepita was willing to concede one more answer. No, it was a bad letter. It wasn't a good letter. Doña Maria fairly gasped. Why, my dear Pepita, I think it was very beautiful. Believe me, I know. No, no. I could have made it a bad letter. Pepita frowned, hunting for a word that would close the matter. It wasn't... It wasn't... Brave, she said. And then she would say no more. She carried the letter off into her own room and could be heard tearing it up. Then she got into bed and lay staring into the darkness, still uncomfortable at having talked in such a fashion. And Doña Maria sat down to her dish, amazed. She had never brought courage to either life or love. Her eyes ransacked her heart. She thought of the amulets and of her beads, her drunkenness. She thought of her daughter. She remembered the long relationship, crowded with the wreckage of exhumed conversations, of fancied slights, of inopportune confidences, of charges of neglect and exclusion. But she must have been mad that day, she remembered beating upon the table. But it's not my fault, she cried. It's not my fault that I was so. It was circumstance. It was the way I was brought up. Tomorrow, I begin a new life. Wait and see, O oh my child. At last she cleared away the table, and sitting down, wrote what she called her first letter. Her first stumbling, misspelled letter in courage. She remembered with shame that in the previous one she had piteously asked her daughter how much she loved her, and had greedily quoted the few and hesitant endearments that Doña Clara had lately ventured to her. Doña Maria could not recall those pages, but she could write some new ones, free and generous. No one else has regarded them as stumbling. It is the famous letter 56, known to the encyclopedists as her second Corinthians because of its immortal paragraph about love. Of the thousands of persons we meet in a lifetime, my child, and so on. It was almost dawn when she finished the letter. She opened the door upon her balcony and looked at the great tiers of stars that glittered above the Andes. Throughout the hours of the night, though there had been few to hear it, the whole sky had been loud with the singing of these constellations. Then she took a candle into the next room and looked at Pepita as she slept and pushed back the damp hair from the girl's face. Let me live now, she whispered. Let me begin again. Two days later, they started back to Lima, and while crossing the bridge of San Luis Rey, the accident which we know befell them. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Bridge of San Luis Rey, Part 1 of 3, by Thornton Wilder. If you've enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Improving literacy is what we are all about. 
and we like to give more than we get. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper.